Live from our studio here in New York City, I'm Josh Lipton. That's Diane King Hall. This is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. We're an hour away from the closing bell on Wall Street markets. Losing some steam here into the close. Dow's off earlier highs, turning negative moments ago. Now on track to snap its streak of five record closing highs in a row. And the NASDAQ now set to snap its nine session win streak. Taking a look at some commodities, oil prices edging higher mid rising tensions in the Red Sea. We're looking at the impact on trade and on gas prices. What you should know before hitting the road for your holiday trip. Plus, we're expecting earnings from Micron after the close. The results coming after the chipmaker updated guidance last month, but with headwinds, including a ban on sales in China, we're going to get analysts' perspective on the numbers and why there could still be upside ahead for the company. All right, let's get you up to speed on the market action here. Seeing a bit of red on the screen, uh, kind of bouncing around this trading session between gains and losses, but right now we are lower. Dow's down about six tenths of a percent, 230 points. The S&P down about nine tenths of a percent, and the tech heavy NASDAQ down also about nine tenths of a percent here. Of course, this coming after a recent rally. It really has been this kind of just yep. steady melt up, Diane, that we saw. We did get some economic data that traded are thinking over today as well. Data showing us U.S. consumer confidence in December surging by nearly 10 points. We're going to have a little bit more on that in just a minute. Also saw sales of previously owned U.S. homes edging higher in November. Let's take a look at yields as well today, too. The 10-year is down about four basis points. More important economic data on the way this week, by the way. We're going to get tomorrow's GDP print, and Friday we're going to get PCE, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, Diane. Yeah, the 10-year ticking a little bit lower um, uh, in terms of like where it is at the the moment. Uh, but you're right. It, what really seems to be throwing kind of cold water on this rally that we've seen, because, you know, this will be the first time in 10 days that we're seeing kind of that bullishness tone change is that FedEx print today. FedEx coming in weaker than expected in terms of its outlook. It's the second quarter in a row of some challenges there and just worries about the impact in terms of the macroeconomic environment, especially when you think about how FedEx can continues to be considered an economic bellwether uh, and what that means about potential headwinds coming. Again, look, it's one day yep. out of what's really been a bullish tone, bullish sentiment on mar on, in the market. We're looking at FedEx down 11 percent at the moment. But I want to jump into some of that economic data that you talked about. There is new data out today uh, taking a look at how Americans feel about the U.S. economy and its path forward. Uh, that would be consumer confidence. Here with a vibe check is our very own Josh Schaefer. So, Josh, break down where consumer confidence stands. It looked like it was a strong number to me uh, and what this says about how the consumer is feeling. All right, stocks down a little bit today for the first mm -hmm. day and as you said, 10, right. 10 days, right? Vibes yep. are high though, guys. Yeah. Come on, let's bring the vibes up. Let's talk consumer yes. confidence. The vibes have been good overall in the US economy over the last month and in the stock market. And that's really what you see reflected in this consumer confidence data. This is the highest reading we've had for consumer confidence since July, which is again when the S&P 500 made its previous 2023 highs. You see stocks and consumer confidence really kind of move together a lot of times. A couple things to point out here from the print that really stuck out to me when you think about recent data is just in general, gas prices, guys, at a 2023 low right now, hovering near that level. We just talked about the stock market. The Dow Jones has been setting new records basically every day for the past five days now. The S&P 500, very close to a record as well. So it's not surprising to see consumers starting to feel better overall about the economy. And they're also feeling better about inflation. Their inflation expectations also coming in at their lowest level in more than two years, which is normally, Fed Chair Powell would say, a welcome sign for the central bank. If people feel like prices are coming down, mm -hmm. that's good for inflation because when people feel like prices are gonna stay high, they'll pay up and that keeps inflation up. So a solid consumer confidence print today overall. Yeah, and we know how important this data point is when you think about the economic picture. Mm -hmm. Consumers, about 70% of economic activity, right? So this portends well for where we see consumer spending going. Uh, what else stood out to you in terms of like how the consumer is doing? It looks like the labor market is holding up, mm -hmm. but what else stood out to you? Yeah, so people still feel good about the labor market, which I think makes sense with what we've seen 
in the job market overall, right? We're talking about a little bit of a slowdown. We keep using that word cooling when we're talking about the labor market, right. but we almost had 200,000 non-farm payroll ads in the month of November. Mm -hmm. And I think consumers put that number in perspective well for us when saying they still feel pretty solid about the labor market. But I do think, Josh, there are some indications of, okay, consumers feel good now. Is that slowdown coming? Because saying you feel good now doesn't always mean that you're gonna spend in six months. Right, right that connection's kind of loose. That connection yeah. is a little bit loose yep. and isn't quite necessarily how it works. So that's something economists usually warn when taking a deeper look at this index is, okay, people feel good now, they feel good about where things are gonna head, but Friday we get a PCE report, that thing yeah. comes in hot and all of a sudden you know people might feel worse about how they're gonna spend in a couple months and that's something I think we're all wondering headed into 24, right, is right, do we so get we'll that little bit of slowdown? We'll see you back here Friday is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, exactly, oh, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll always here, come on. <laughs> Josh Schaefer, thank you my Never friend. Never a day off. Always good to have you. Markets losing some steam here heading into the close. The Dow and NASDAQ on track to snap nine straight days of gains. We're now at session lows here and volumes are below average though as we head into the holiday. Joining us now is Kevin Mon, Hennian and Walsh, Chief Investment Officer. Kevin, good to have you on the program. So all right, we're taking maybe a bit of a, a breather in this trading session, but listen, the bias has been to buy. We've seen this really steady melt up. I'm just interested, Kevin, looking ahead to next year, you see this rally continuing? The markets had to take a breather at some point, right? As investors came to the realization back in November that we've reached the end of this rate hike cycle and we have saw both stock and bond markets shoot higher. Fast forward into December and all of a sudden now, many retail investors start to come off the sideline out of a fear of missing out on the next leg up in this bull market run. Then we heard Chair Powell talk about last week and essentially reiterate that yes, we have reached the end of this rate hike cycle, and in all likelihood, rate cuts will start next year with the Fed updating their forecast for rate cuts to 75 basis points next year from 50 basis points earlier. What we have to remember is that the Fed doesn't cut interest rates, Josh, when the economy is doing well. They cut interest rates when the economy is not doing well. And according to their own projections for 2024, they believe GDP growth is going to slow to just 1.4%. That's coming off of 5.3% in the third quarter of this year and a current estimate for the fourth quarter from the Atlanta Fed of 2.7% in the fourth quarter. So, yes, rate cuts are coming, but along with that comes an economic slowdown. So, uh, Kevin, the expectation, obviously, for rate cuts in 2024, and generally there's been an expectation of a few. Uh, what are your expectations for when the Fed claims victory? According to their own projections coming out of their meeting last week, if you look at their summary of economic projections, their forecast for PCE next year is to end the year at 2.4%. I believe they're going to declare victory at 2.4% because even by their own projections, inflation doesn't come down to 2% until the end of 2026. The economy cannot withstand itself at these interest rates for that long. So they're gonna have to start cutting towards the second half of next year. I do believe uh, in terms of what you just said, Dan, there could be four 25 basis point cuts during the second half of next year. Right now they're forecasting, it seems around three 25 basis point rate cuts, but it's going to become the guessing game. When are they going to start cutting and how much are they going to cut by? And I can't wait to come back on your show next mm -hmm. year and stop talking about the Federal Reserve and stop talking about fundamentals and company earnings once again. And Kevin, I'm interested, you know, you point out U.S. economy is slowing against that backdrop, Kevin. How are you thinking about corporate earnings growth next year? I believe that once the Fed actually starts cutting interest rates, that will improve the outlook for earnings growth towards the second half of the year. However, if the Fed's forecasts are right and we experience the type of material economic slowdown that they're forecasting for the first half of next year, I believe that earnings need to come in slightly from where they're currently forecasted right now. Obviously, as they start to come in, that creates the potential for beats on those earnings, which could actually elevate some stocks. But regardless of when those rate cuts take place, I think Josh and Diane, you would agree with me over the next two to three years, interest rates should be lower, yield should be lower, inflation should be lower, and economic growth should start to moderate. And if those three things happen, well, guess what? Opportunities in both stocks and bonds exist, especially in those areas that haven't rallied thus far in 2023. 
So, Kevin, when you think about then the opportunities that could be popping up and especially how you're setting up for 2024, where are you putting new client money, especially when you're preparing for the expectation of rate cuts? Great question, Diana. It really does come down to what those clients' objectives are, what their risk tolerance is, and what their investment time frame is. If their goal is income, then we would certainly find tremendous opportunities on the fixed income side of the markets right now in areas such as municipal bonds or even preferred securities. Many of your listeners might be surprised to know that coming out of the end of rate hike cycles, historically, preferred securities have been the best performing fixed income class with an average annual return of just over 14% in the year following the end of rate hike cycles, which I believe we're in right now. In terms of equities, if you're looking for growth opportunities, certainly we see a lot of potential in the information technology sector. And I don't dismiss the opportunities that exist in generative artificial intelligence or the transformative nature of AI. But I do think what's been lost in the AI race is the importance of cybersecurity, which I always call the glue that holds the technology puzzle together. In fact, many have argued that the proliferation of AI could actually increase the number and the effectiveness of cyber attacks across the world. So you're gonna need more AI to help combat AI generated cyber attacks. So we see opportunities in the cybersecurity sector. Three stocks that we currently hold within our technology revolution trust here at Smart Trust include CrowdStrike, CyberArk, and Fortinet. And Kevin, I'm going to get you out on this, on that same theme of AI. Would you be advising people to keep committing capital to some of those names that really become sort of the faces of this boom of interest in AI, like NVIDIA or Microsoft? Yeah, certainly Microsoft, I believe, is going to be the ultimate winner of the AI race, but they'll be more than just winner. NVIDIA is a critical component to the overall AI ecosystem, and they're going to still experience growth out five to 10 years from where we stand right now. But you have to consider valuations and attractive entry points. So are those areas to invest in? They certainly are. But I believe there's even more attractive opportunities at more attractive valuations within the AI ecosystem, especially if you look at some of the data centers, some of the chip plays, the semiconductors, the proliferation of the actual technology itself. There are opportunities, but investors would be wise to do their due diligence as opposed to just investing in a couple of those top tier, well-recognized names, Josh. All right, Kevin Mon, thank you for great insight across the board, whether we're talking about NVIDIA and Microsoft to where does the Fed land and when does it declare victory? Thanks so much, Kevin. My pleasure, happy holidays. All right, happy holidays. All right, we wanna to get to some trending tickers. Shares of FedEx uh, losing major ground today is sinking more than 11% after cutting its full year revenue forecast. The company also reporting a profit miss for its second quarter. Um, it's Look, this is the second quarter in a row, Josh, where it's lowered its sales outlook. We talked about that earlier. Uh, it blamed customers moving to cheaper services on its call. Um, it's, its projection is a low single-digit decline in revenue for the fiscal year. Um, it had previously forecast, uh, put out a forecast of flat sales. Uh, Stiefel put out a note on it saying it wasn't the quarter it wanted to see. Many analysts, I'm sure, are saying that. Uh, and you can see that in terms of the investor reaction, certainly not the quarter any investor wanted to see. Uh, they talked about the capital intensive part of the business that it encountered and just historic levels of margin compression. But Stifo actually said they think they don't think it's unreasonable to uh, to or they think it's unreasonable to expect a perfectly linear path in terms of its uh, in terms of its own trajectory. So we'll see into how it plays out tomorrow in kind of a follow to its earnings because we know you know we saw the knee jerk reaction after the bell yesterday the continued downdraft today. Yeah, I mean the, the stock is getting hit hard today. Mm -hmm. We should still know. I mean. It's been a tremendous run for the stock. Even now, it's still yeah. up about 40% this year. And, you know, the story there all this year, Diane, was really execution, efficiency, cost cutting. A lot of focus in this earnings print on FedEx Express, the mm -hmm. company's Express Air business. And there you did see sales drop about 5.6%. You saw operating margins 1.3% versus 3.1% a year ago. And FedEx, you saw, really kind of trying to stay confident. They were talking about how margin, margins at Express will return, though some analysts don't seem as confident. I saw analyst Raymond James quoted as saying that they're concerned that turning the express segment may be structurally impaired in their yep. opinion. So again, though, let's see how it flushes out.
Indeed. All, All right. right. Moving on, here's another big mover. Shares of Alphabet trading slightly higher today, up about 1.6%. That's after reports that the tech giant is preparing for an AI-centered advertising shakeup. So this one is on a headline. It's coming to us uh, from the, the information, information yeah. right? Uh, which basically point that Google is planning restructure part of its ad sales unit. And what it sounds like is they're going to be relying more on AI-generated yep. ads, Diane, that can be sold to customers, largely automated generate a ton of money and at fatter margins than if ad related sales being conducted overseen by yeah. people. Yeah, and we're, it's no surprise to see obviously um, Alphabet, uh, Google doubling down on AI, machine learning, large language models. We know that that is more than the flavor of the month. It's the new frontier. So uh, it, it looks like it's reportedly to increase um, the ad purchasing and, and, you know, kind of taking down some of the costs that come with human labor. Uh, now, to be fair, they haven't announced any kind of layoffs, so it is unclear yet what that would mean in terms of um, in terms of their labor, in terms of their workforce. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look ahead, we've had analysts on the show saying you look ahead, mm -hmm. and if you're an ad-supported business, you have the election next year, yeah. you've got the Olympics next year. I mean, that sounds broadly supportive for global yeah. ad sales, and maybe Indeed. that's what investors are kind of sniffing out. Yeah. Stock's up about 60% this year. Yeah, good. Uh, uh, strong buying uh, there. Uh, we want to take a look at shares of Paramount. Now, they have been kind of uh, choppy trading, but reversing some earlier gains after the stock was upgraded to equal weight from underweight at Wells Fargo. Analysts noting uh, M&A prospects in 2024. Uh, they say they believe it's going to be a value unlocking strategy. Their new price target from Wells Fargo is 18 bucks a share from Paramount, uh, they don't think it's direct to consumer pivot will be successful. Uh, but what keeps them from being more negative, they said, is just they just think that, look, the environment is ripe for deals and uh, consolidation within the media landscape. They pointed to some previous deals and just deal activity being a theme in the landscape, uh, in the media landscape, when you think about, say, Warner Brother Discovery and Comcast, what happens with that, and just the media industry just facing change in general. So uh, it is interesting to see that the stock price has been kind of uh, choppy today. It's been flip-flopping. Yeah, I mean, and Bloomberg, by the way, reporting that Paramount Global's in talks to sell BET yep. to a management-led investor group, price of around $2 billion being discussed. And I think that kind of perfectly dovetails with this note from the team at Wells Fargo. They mm -hmm. e upgrade to equal weights. They're not bulled up on the stock. I mean, they're, they're at a hold. Price target's 18, but this is what they're talking about, right? What they're responding to are these press reports that Skydance Media and Redbird um, Capital exploring an offer for parent company National Amusements. And that's what Wells Fargo, that's the basis of the upgrade. They think, yes, NAI might like to sell you know, a controlling stake to a content operator. Maybe New Year you get more headlines yeah. on this story. We'll see. We'll be waiting. Mm -hmm. All right, we are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. And coming up, a new installment of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to look at the AI space and tell you which stock is a buy and which one to avoid. And prices at the pump, we're seeing gas prices dip right ahead of the holidays. We're going to tell you where they're headed next. And moves in crypto, we're going to tell you if the time is right to jump into the space. And now all that and more when Yahoo Finance returns.
Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick leaving the company at the end of the year, and Dan Howley is here with all the details. Dan. That's right. Bobby is leaving after more than 30 years at Activision Blizzard. Uh, it's a company that basically, you know, has his fingerprints all over. He's taken it from, uh, you know, a, a smaller uh, uh, video game company to, you know, the ac acquisition of Blizzard uh, to form ac uh, Activision Blizzard, then the uh, King acquisition, and then obviously this is, you know, his kind of send off because Microsoft ended up with this deal for Activision Blizzard, that $69 billion uh, deal, which by the way, the FTC is still fighting. So we'll see what happens yeah. there. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Bobby Kotick obviously leaving here. I think, you know, some of the things that are, are noteworthy uh, are the fact that um, the, the company has pushed out some of the biggest games out there, right? I mean, part of the reason why Microsoft paid that $69 billion is you know, Call of Duty. Yeah. Uh, the king part is not to be discounted, by the way. It's one of the largest mobile gaming companies out there, and mobile gaming is absolutely massive. So, you know, we talk all about Call of Duty for sure, but the, the king part, they make Candy Crush. I was going to say, don't forget Candy Crush. Yeah, that's that's the big. That's one of the <laughs> biggest things here. Um, you know, there are obviously though, with the good, there's the bad. Mm. Uh, his handling of the organization uh, has been heavily criticized. There's been multiple reports of bad culture there. The kind of um, frat house culture. Uh, uh, you know, different executives have been forced out over time, and so. Uh, it seems as though this is basically, you know, the the end run for him, uh, perhaps in gaming. You know, you can never know the future, uh, but stepping out after more than 30 years at this company, you can't imagine where where we would go from here. Well, speaking of that, where do you go when you think about the leadership and the executive uh, shuffles that are happening? Um, who's the new king or queen, for that matter? Uh, well, Sarah Bond is the new queen of uh, Xbox games, so she's uh, going to be kind of the, the uh, end-all, be-all for uh, Xbox and gaming at Microsoft, but above her is Phil Spencer, who was basically, mm -hmm. she took Phil's position uh, and Phil kind of moved on up. So the, the hierarchy is largely unchanged uh, on the Activision Blizzard side. They're kind of gonna continue to be their own thing. Microsoft, I don't think, wants to meddle too much there. They want them to do their, their own thing, similar to what they did uh, with Bethesda when they uh, uh, brought on uh, ZeniMax. Uh, but uh, the Microsoft side of things, there have been some changes. I think that the, the big deal here, though, is you know with, with Kodak out, it basically means that now this is Microsoft's baby. Right, you know, it's sure there's going to still be, you know, Activision is going to be its its own thing, but it's going to have to answer to Microsoft, and it's going to have to basically live up to the expectations of six sixty nine billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, but we'll we'll have to see. You know, one of the games that just came out uh, 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 from Zenimax, which is uh, Starfield, that's underneath Microsoft, wasn't didn't begin development under Microsoft, but uh, uh, with Starfield hasn't done super well, mm. uh, you know, the Game Awards just came and went, didn't uh, win Game of the Year, uh, went to a, a much smaller game studio. So mm. we'll, we'll have to see what happens with, you know, the, the touch that Microsoft has yeah. on the gaming side of things. But yeah. they're, they're a juggernaut now. Yeah, but certainly a, a big move there mm. with Bobby being out. All right, Dan Halley, great reporting as usual. Meanwhile, crypto charging higher into the year end on approval hopes for spot Bitcoin ETFs and the promise of Fed rate cuts in 2024. Bitcoin is now trading above $43,000, a level we have not seen since April 2022. It's now up more than 160% year to date. Joining us now to discuss is Fundstrat Global Advisors Vice President of Digital Asset Strategy, Sean Farrell. So, Sean, um, when you think about where crypto is now, you say now is an opportune time to be fully allocated in the market. That's a quote. What's the thesis behind that? Yeah, uh, first, thanks for having me. Um, uh, you know, right now we have this uh, perfect concoction of both macro and industry specific tailwinds um you know obviously everyone knows uh the the dovish sentiments from uh the fed a, a couple weeks ago or last week rather um really put put bears on their heels you know certainly uh suggested that 
Um, you know, inflation was tamed, and regardless of whether it is or not, it does seem like the worst of the tightening is behind us. Um, and then from an industry specific setup, um, you know, we have obviously, as you alluded to, an ETF approval that is anticipated to come within a few weeks, uh, which, you know, I think should bring a new cohort of investors into the fold, uh, increase flows into uh, digital assets. Um, and then we have the halving coming up in uh, at the end of Q1 into Q2. So uh, there's really this, um, you know, perfect storm of positive tailwinds heading into next year. And, and Sean, just to uh, emphasize that one point on that spot, Bitcoin ETF, I'm interested to know whether, you know, do you think that's a real, if and when we see that approval, maybe early next year, right? Do you see, see that's a real positive catalyst for Bitcoin? Because, you know, the team at JP Morgan, it was interesting, Sean, I don't know if you saw this note, they were telling clients recently, they actually assigned a pretty high chance they think that ultimately is kind of a, a sell the news moment, but I guess you disagree mm -hmm. with that. Yeah, look, it's, it depends on your time frame, uh, and we'll be watching closely to see how we trade uh, into ETF approval. Because uh, you know, functionally speaking, even if the ETFs are approved, you know, we think we'll, they'll be approved between January eighth and January tenth. Um, even if they're approved on those dates, you're not going to see any uh, sizable inflows until uh, those products launch. And uh, so, you know, there certainly is a scenario in which you could have people front running the ETF news and perhaps you have some, you know, acute uh, drawdown following uh, actual approval. Uh, but, you know, I think we're telling clients it's, it's probably not worth trading around uh, too, in too cute of a manner, uh, just because, you know, we think any consolidation post ETF approval uh, is going to be short lived. So, Sean, I want to ask you about FTX in particular. There have been some new headlines about FTX and just investors cashing in around it. And, you know, originally that kind of led to the crypto winter. What does that picture look like now? Uh, well, you know, the FTX news is rather positive in terms of uh, it seems like uh, creditors are going to be made whole. Uh, this is on a, or at least close to it. Um, and uh, obviously this is on a dollarized basis, so they will not be receiving, uh, you know, their pro rata portion of the value of the crypto assets that they had, uh, you know, on the exchange. But I think it's a, a positive sign that, you know, as an industry, we've uh, cleared out a lot of the, you know, malicious actors and, you um, uh, you know, a lot of more sophisticated players have come in to uh, provide, uh, you know, better centralized infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to have another uh, FTX scenario happen again. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a positive. And Sean, I want to get you out of here on this. Let's say, you know, Sean, I'm listening to this interview. I agree with Sean Farrell. He's making a ton of sense. I'm bullish on crypto in 2024. Where where should you be investing, Sean? Where do you think people should be committing capital in the space? Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, it goes without saying, Bitcoin is a, a pretty great, great place to be. Uh, we're, we're very excited about where miners are at right now. We think they offer pretty... Um, you know, interesting data to Bitcoin heading into next year. A lot of them are well capitalized um, after, you know, a lot of, you know, they issued a lot of equity last year to shore up their balance sheets. Um, and as a result, actually underperformed this year by and large. Uh, but a lot of them are well capitalized. And uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening uh, within the Bitcoin economy. You know, there's there's been a lot of activity uh, with inscriptions, ordinals, an appetite to build a, a layer two um, ecosystem atop Bitcoin, and as a result, that's created a lot of fee pressure uh, on the Bitcoin network. And, uh, you know, this has uh, been a windfall for miners. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of analysts on the street are going to start to price that into a lot of their, their outlooks for miners. Uh, and we're going to see them uh, really benefit in, in the coming 12 months. Fundstrat Global Advisors, Vice President Sean Farrell. Sean, Sean, thank you so much for joining the show today. Appreciate that insight. Thanks for having me.
Let's do a quick check of the markets heading into the break here. Stocks falling ahead of the closing bell. Dow's off about 320 points. The S&P 500 down 1.1%. Look at the NASDAQ. That's down about 1.2%. Of course, the context there is coming off strong and steady rally. We're going to keep a close eye, though, on those markets as we head into the close. Meanwhile, up next, a new installment of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll be looking at the AI space to tell you which stock is a buy and, of course, which one to avoid. It is a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye, brought to you by E-Trade from Morgan Stanley. Our goal to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. And today we're looking at the buzziest topic of the year, artificial intelligence. And we're talking about how to incorporate it into your portfolio. And I'm here with Granite Shares founder and CEO, Will Rind. And uh, thank you for stopping by here today. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, I would call this a darling of this year's uh, uh, AI boom, and that's NVIDIA. Tell us a little bit about why you like this stock. Up 240%, can't go wrong there. Yeah, well, Jared, the chart, in, in a way, a picture tells a thousand stories. And the, the story this year has been all about AI, and particularly NVIDIA. And NVIDIA has really captured that zeitgeist for any investor that's looking to get exposure to AI. Now, if you think about AI as a theme, NVIDIA is a company that provides the picks and shovels, so to speak, to allow companies to thrive 
uh, in this particular space. The performance has been phenomenal. All right, now let's get to some of your, re your reasons here. First, we've got to look at earnings. This is a solid company, uh, but tell us what you like in the fundamentals. Yeah, so the earnings have been really when you get hype like AI, it's about can a company live up to that hype? And NVIDIA has been a company that has lived up to that hype this year. Q1, Q2, and Q3 earnings all beat expectations. And we have practically every analyst on the street expecting the company to continue to deliver. Practically, but not quite all of them. I believe there are, what, 31 buys and a couple holds there as well. What do you, what do you think about the analyst reaction to this stock? I think so far it's been pretty phenomenal. I mean, when you get that sort of larger spectrum, like you said, almost everybody's a buy. I think you have three holds, zero sells, and the average price target significantly above where we trade today. That tells you that across the street, I think the, the view uniformly is bullish on the stock. All right, and I think we could, I described it as a darling, but also the poster child of AI here. We've seen a lot of the gains uh, tied to NVIDIA performance. Tell us about this phenomenon. Yeah, so you know, in terms of NVIDIA, I think the AI phenomenon has been what has caught investors' imagination. But this is a company that, remember, was very famous for delivering in the gaming sector, particularly when people were very excited about the metaverse. And so it was a company that revenue stream-wise is diversified among its data center business, the gaming business, and of course, the GPUs most famously um, that are powering the chat GPTs and things of the world. All right, want to pour a little bit of cold water in here. Not everything's perfect. Uh, what does the stock have going against it right now? I think the biggest risk to NVIDIA is China, is relationship with China, because there is some political risk that has come into this with the export controls on advanced technologies from the United States to China, of which NVIDIA gets caught up because of chips particularly. So there is some risk here. At the moment, the company has a workaround to that, but we'll see, obviously, how that goes going forward. But the biggest risk is this um, political element. Yeah, and let me just stick on this for just two seconds because I've watched how the export controls or whatever the specifications come out, NVIDIA crosses a few wires and magically they're able to ship a new product in a number of months here to get around them. Can that continue, do you think? I think this is a company that you don't want to bet against. Who knows in terms of the future? you know, how they'll be able to, to continue. But I think that what they've shown is it's a company that has continued to reinvent itself in different circumstances. And as of right now, despite the export controls, the company is, is keeping up with expectations. All right, don't bet against NVIDIA, but we got to talk about another ticker here. And uh, if you like AI, guess what? They got the ticker, it is AI. C3 AI is a company, uh, relatively small there. I was looking at their revenue, it's only a quarter of a billion dollars per year. Um, what don't you like about this particular stock, which is up 140 or 188% this year? So as, again, it's been up, incredible performance this year on a standalone basis, but we're not talking about this year. We're talking about next year, we're talking about the future. With C3 AI, as you said, Jared, the clue is in the name. Got a lot of retail investors excited because it had AI in the name. A lot of people piled into the stock and drove the stock price up. Now, unlike Nvidia, when we talk about hype and companies living up to the hype, you know, this company has not lived up to the hype so far. And I think going forward, it's gonna be more challenging. All right, well, that's not the only reason that you have uh, revenue guidance. That came in a little bit weak. Uh, well, I, I believe they held it, but what don't you like about the company's prospects from their own perspective? For, on, on the revenue perspective, sales are slowing down. Again, this is a company that has you know, a large portion of its re revenue tied to a contract with one particular company, it's Baker Hughes, in the energy space. That deal is supposed to expire in 2025. No signs, clear signs at the moment that's going to review. So some, perhaps some, some uncertainty around the future revenue, but I think in terms of the, the portfolio of apps, starting to see that weaker sales growth and of course still a company that's not profitable. All right, one more reason ticking down these, I said it was up, what, 188% this year, a little bit overvalued? Yeah, and I think again, if we look back to what we were talking about with Nvidia, this time we look at the analysts that cover this particular stock, there isn't really any clear bullish sentiment sells, there are some buys, holds, but it's, it's pretty evenly distributed. So I think it shows you that the collective, or at least the average, price going forward is actually below where we trade today, unlike NVIDIA, which was higher. So forecast for next year, below where we trade today, sales slowing down, 
a company that hasn't managed to really grow into that hype of AI that was expected at the beginning of the year. All right, well, every dog has the ability to shake off its fleas every now and again. What can C3 AI do to turn it around? I think, put simply, has to be able to live up to the hype, to the expectations. And ultimately, when it comes to stocks, you have to take more than just the theme, the AI you know, history itself. Mm -hmm. We've got to see that coming through in the earnings. And so, irrespective of what the analyst forecasts say, the company now has to deliver on earnings for that to fulfill its expectations. All right, interesting stock there. And I should note, it's actually still 83% down from its record high several years ago. But just to recap here, uh, your buy is NVIDIA, and uh, let's round this out. We have NVIDIA there. Company had strong third quarter earnings results. Wall Street is bullish with 31 out of 34 analysts rating it a buy. And you see NVIDIA as a poster child say that it is a poster child for AI exposure. And on the flip side, we have C3 AI. It hasn't fully leveraged the AI boom. It gave weak revenue guidance, and it is overvalued. Uh, Will, thank you for stopping by here today. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for, so much for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to be bringing you three new episodes a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern.
Well, it looks like Christmas is coming early for drivers at the pump this holiday season. As forecasts show, they can expect to pay 80 cents less per gallon than they did this fall. But as the price of crude fluctuates this week due to global conflict and trade disruptions, will the low prices last? Here to help us answer that question, we turn to Patrick DeHaan from Gas Buddy as part of our investor guide to 2024. So can this last, Patrick? Well, we're already seeing a little bit of a break here, a lull in the decline that's continued 13 weeks. It probably won't make it a full 14 weeks. On some security concerns in the Red Sea is who these attack uh, oil tankers and other vessels. We've seen the price of oil rise. In addition, last week's comments by the Fed hinting at potential interest rate declines are likely to spark an increase in demand potentially in the year ahead. And with that, gas prices have bumped up just slightly. Uh, we're showing the national average, which had dipped as low as 302 a gallon, according to gas, but now at about 306. Motorists in more states are seeing slight increases ahead of the holidays. The national average now basically on par with where we were last year, but we could see a little bit more increases over the next few days into the holiday and into the close of the new year, or I should say the close of 2023 into the new year. And Patrick, so you're, we're basically on par, you know, to where, where, where we were last year, but I'm, I'm interested, how does it compare, how does it stack up, Patrick, to where we were pre-pandemic? I ask, because I think a lot of times people, that's kind of what they're basing it to. That's what they're comparing it with. Yeah. Yeah, we still remain a bit elevated. Uh, although we made a lot of progress this year in kind of returning to some of those norms, we're still a little bit above average. Of course, it was back in 2022, the early national average was at its highest, uh, last year, we saw the yearly national average decline to about uh, $3.99 a gallon. This year, it's fallen about 50 cents from that to about $3.49. And I'm hopeful that 2024 will continue the trend of falling prices, although it still should be a relatively strong year. I think for the oil sector, we've seen U.S. domestic oil production continue to increase. In fact, government data today looking at weekly estimates with a uh, re-benchmarking now show the U.S. at record oil production mm -hmm. domestically. So that, that makes sense in terms of what we're seeing in terms of where oil prices are today. There have been some fluctuation, but when you balance out the production, uh, U.S. production with the kind of worries about what's happening uh, in the Red Sea, uh, why does this, how should consumers be looking at this as they kind of prepare their uh, balance, their household balance sheet for 2024? What should consumers be baking in uh, in terms of gas prices? Well, obviously, there have been a lot of volatility in prices here the last couple of years, made worse, exacerbated by Russia's war in Ukraine. And we have ge geopolitical tensions that are really closing 2023, and it sets the tone for 2024. Expect the unexpected. We don't necessarily know what geopolitical conditions may arise in the year ahead, uh, but situations like China hinting to the United States are essentially telling the U.S. that it will reunify with ta Taiwan it's those types of geopolitical situations that could unravel and could cause uh, more risk in the year ahead. I think consumers will get a 2024 that's a bit more friendly. Part of that really due to increases in refining capacity that came online this year and more of those capacity increases that will continue into the new year, as well as a continued transition to more EVs, which has really stifled the growth of gasoline demand. But even comments from the Fed in terms of what they do in the year ahead could set the par for where we see gas prices next year. If the economy expands, we could see prices higher than what we anticipate. And Patrick, you know, we talk about um, gas prices, the national average, but of course there's big difference regionally as well. I'm just curious, Patrick, as you look across the country, where are gas prices the highest? Well, you can see the map over my shoulder there, the West Coast, a beacon of yellow colors where gas prices are still high, California, Looking at a statewide average, that's a dollar and forty-five cents above the national average at some four sixty a gallon. Whereas you get into the Gulf states, where a lot of that oil infrastructure is, refineries have a good presence there, coupled with the low gasoline taxes. Uh, Texas, Oklahoma, areas of the Deep South generally have prices well below the three dollar a gallon mark. So for any motors traveling for Christmas, they certainly may be surprised going from California to Arizona to New Mexico to Texas. And Patrick, I got a lot of family and friends in California. I think you said a buck forty-five above the national average. Why is that, Patrick? Yeah, a lot of this is really blamed on California being in a league of its own when it comes to gasoline. The type of gasoline required the highest gasoline taxes in the nation. And don't forget, 
California has a cap and trade program, uh, which assesses now a price per gallon essentially to burn that gasoline as well as Washington state. All of those costs added up are really what's impacting California. But I will say that with refinery issues so severe this past fall in California, there's still a lot of room for California prices to fall as the, even as the national average starts to go up. So that, that difference between the national average and California will likely continue to close in the weeks ahead. Patrick DeHaan, Gas Buddy Head of Petroleum Analysis. Patrick, we always love having you on this show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Meanwhile, home buying activity picked up slightly in November as mortgage rates began to fall, albeit very slowly. Total existing home sales inched up 0.8% in November on a seasonally adjusted basis when compared to the previous month, ending a five-month streak of monthly declines. It comes as the housing market is still pretty much stalled in the last year due to high rates and home prices. Here to break down what these new stats may mean for the industry is Lance Lambert, CEO and co-founder at Resi Club. Uh, Lance... Always good to see you on this issue. Uh, here's what struck me, Lance. So existing home sales, they rose by 0.8% in November. It was just ahead of October's level. The economist at the National Association of Realtors, Lance, sees what he calls a marked turn higher in existing home sales going forward. Um, that strikes me as pretty optimistic talk, Lance, but I'm interested to get your take. Yeah, when you look at the actual number of transactions that are occurring right now in the existing housing market, there's not a lot occurring. That 3.8 million number that's seasonally adjusted, that's very low. That's about as low as you can possibly go. And it's really just, uh, you know, still the transactions of like death, divorces. But what's mm -hmm. been sucked out of the market are people like selling their home to go buy something new because of a lifestyle change or they just want more space. They're only doing it if they have to do it. And the reason being is that affordability is very strained with mortgage rates having gone up from 3% to 4% to 5% to 6% to 7% and then hitting this uh, this fall at 8%. So the reason that some of the housing economists like NAR are getting a little more optimistic is because that affordability, which has been a burden on the housing market and has kept transactions very low, is starting to loosen up. We've seen some affordability improvements with the average 30-year fixed mortgage rate going down from what was 8.03, a 23-year high in October, to now, as of right now, it's 6.64, according to Mortgage News Daily. So that's creating some affordability improvement. I mean, for the typical buyer of a mortgage around 500000 that's about a monthly improvement of $400 a month. So it's, it's nothing to scoff at. It's definitely an improvement to affordability. And the other thing is we're now moving into the seasonally stronger window of the year, moving into that spring season where some of the people who maybe have put off selling a home because they didn't want to give up their 3% mortgage rate for a 7 or 8 might now reconsider now that we've been here for a while. They maybe had some lifestyle changes, maybe had another kid, and they're like, you know what, if I can get it down to 6 something or if I buy down the rate and get it to a high 5, I'll do it. And so the industry is hoping that we'll start to see some of those sellers come out and some more of the buyers who've been priced out come back in now that rates have come down to the, uh, the mid six range. So Lance, there certainly has been some loosening, especially when you take a look at today's data. We know that you have your own data as well. Does your data line up with say where we're putting a pen in this and you see some unlocking of demand, not just because of the seasonal uh, changes that we typically see in the spring and summer when it comes to the housing market. Uh, is this a turning point that we're starting to see? I, I think what we're seeing is that most of this is going to be seasonal. We're going to see a, a, see a seasonal uptick. But the, if rates stay here, if we stay here for duration and we stay in the mid sixes and don't go back up into the sevens and consumer confidence starts to realize, hey, maybe we aren't having a recession here, I think we'll start to get existing home sales moving up a bit. The question is just how much can that number really move up? with affordability still, still being strained, and there's still being some type of lock-in effect in the market. Uh, but it does feel like that the worst could potentially be behind us for existing home sales, and that volumes will hopefully start to move up. The question is just how much of an uptick we will see. 
And Lance, let's just dig into affordability a little bit more. You know, Mortgage News Daily, Lance, they're saying the 30-year fixed is at 6.64%. You, you talk to a lot of smart folks. Where do, where do they see that heading? You know, six months from now, could we be testing, you know, 5.5, even 5%? Yeah, that is a great question. And so uh, as financial markets loosen, like we've seen over the past two months, and the 10-year Treasury yield comes down, and the MBS market uh, get, gets more activity, you can see those rates come down. The question is just going to be how much of a loosening do we get? Uh, you know, if the economy holds firm and still remains strong and the Fed doesn't cut really fast, it's possible that yields and mortgage rates could stay elevated for a prolonged period of time. Although there's the possibility that the spread between the 30-year fixed mortgage rate and the 10-year Treasury yield, if that were to start to normalize as the Fed starts to cut rates, uh, right now the gap is around uh, 2.7 percentage points, and it's normally 1.7 percentage point. So if just the spread alone could normalize, we could mm -hmm. see mortgage rates down to 5.64 uh, just with a normalized spread. So there, there's a lot of things to be looking out for for next year. Uh, the biggest question is how fast does the Fed actually cut? And the second is, do the do financial markets start to ease and the spread between the 30-year um, fixed mortgage rate and the 10-year Treasury yield start to normalize? Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly be looking to see what that uh, when that normalization uh, pans out. Lance Lambert, CEO and co-founder of Resi Club, thanks for joining us as usual. Thank you for having me. You got it. Coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. You are looking at a market under pressure right now. Stay with us. That is the closing bell on Wall Street. And let us get a quick check of the markets here on the Wi-Fi Interactive. 
We are in an afternoon of selling, and let's just check out. We have all the major indices down 1% or more. This is the worst day in months. And just a reminder that anything can happen even late December. So in the NASDAQ here, we got some selling at 2 p.m., and it just accelerated into the bond market, closed at 3 p.m. Eastern. And now looks like we just closed at the lows of the day. Uh, you take a look at the S&P 500. It's going to be a very similar story, but I want to show you a three-month chart here. We are very much overextended and you could say do for some kind of a pullback here, but really didn't see any catalyst. Uh, pretty interesting to see these things develop. Sometimes it's just technical selling. Sometimes it's just a large order in a very illiquid time of year, and that's what we are at. All 11 sectors in the red at the close of the day. Utilities are worse off. That's down 2% right now. Staples and consumer discretionary also down. Financials down 1.73%. Communication services, the least bad off. That is down three quarters of 1%. And let's take a look inside the NASDAQ 100. Haven't seen a red board like this in quite some time. I will note Alphabet for its part is up 1.24%, but Nvidia down 3%, uh, Tesla down almost 4%, Starbucks down 3%. So a lot of uh, dark red here that we just haven't seen in some time. And I will get a quick check on the Dow as well. I don't see one green square or rectangle on here, so I'm gonna say it's a total loss for the Dow 30 components. Coca-Cola and Disney each off more than 2% there. And uh, let's take a look Look at the EV space. This is highly levered, and a lot of these companies are higher beta. They tend to move more to the upside and to the downside with the markets. Uh, looks like NEO is down 10%, Lucid Motors also down about 10%, Nikola down 8%, so some pretty big movements there. And I want to check in on Chinese stocks as well. Um, these operate on their own fundamentals. Just covered NEO, that's down 10%, but JD.com down 4%, Li uh, down about 5.9%. Let's see, energy was decently off earlier today. That's when we had a break of crude oil to the upside, but all of these issues ending in the red, except for ConocoPhillips there down or up 17 basis points. Exxon uh, up, or excuse me, Exxon down one and two thirds of a percent. Chevron down one percent or so. BP also there down about one percent. And I want to take a look at the travel sector and see if there's any ebullience there that we could uh, kind of glean. And I'm not seeing any. It looks like uh, save. Okay, Spirit Airlines, uh, 44 percent there. I think the investors will take that. But Airbnb down four percent. Carnival Cruise Lines down three percent, and Norwegian down four percent as as well. And uh, let me see if I can find our streaming workspace here. And here's our heat map. We did have some interesting action just before the bell. Got some word that Warner Brothers Discovery, and we can see that here down about 5.66% on the day, might be, and this is according to Axios, uh, might be considering a merger with Paramount. So David Zasloff and Sherry Redstone getting together. We're going to be covering that story, you bet. But for the most part, not seeing a lot of green today, guys. All right, thanks so much, Jared. Uh, we want to get into that breaking news. Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zaslov uh, reportedly meeting with Paramount Global CEO Bob Backish to, uh, to discuss a possible merger. This reportedly actually happening, uh, the meeting reportedly happening yesterday, according to Axios. I've gone out to a source to see if we can confirm uh, that information. Uh, we know that we've been discussing the potential for industry consolidation. Uh, earlier, you had a, a note out from Wells Fargo on this expecting that deal activity to occur. Uh, Axios saying apparently Zaslav also spoke to Sherry Redstone. We know she owns Paramount's uh, parent company. Um, that would be it's, but it, it remains to be seen what would happen with National Am Amusements. Uh, the question remains about this is certainly not a merger of equals when you look at the market cap of Warner Brothers. That's over 28 billion. Uh, Paramount is around 10 billion, Josh. Uh, so it will be interesting to see what the industry landscape is going to look like now and if this deal proceeds. But it sounds like it's certainly in the works. We reportedly have bankers on the line discussing this one. Yeah, so it's interesting because we were, we were literally just talking about this mm -hmm. earlier in the show. This has been, you know, the, the rumors and reports about Paramount have been going on for a while now. Uh, what was the future of this company? Was it a, you know, a, a strategic partner? Would it be a buyer? Um, the stock had jumped earlier this month because we did have reports from various outlets that, um, remember, Skydance and Redbird, it was told, mm -hmm. were eyeing a potential deal to buy a majority stake in NAI, which is, is the parent company. Yep. Um, and in fact, we were talking about how some analysts 
they were only on the sidelines because of rumors like this. They yeah. would have had a sell, but they were at a hold because they were waiting for this kind of news to hit. So very interesting that it comes. Um, you know, folks are talking about the possible synergies of why you would deal like this. They're pointing to, you know, WBD's international distribution. Streaming. And, that, that gives a boost to Paramount. Um, Paramount's got the children's programming they're noting, mm -hmm. those assets. Maybe that's that could be helpful to WBD's streaming ambitions. Yep. So um, it's certainly interesting, the synergies we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, and then it, it, especially when you think about the streaming landscape in general and a combination of the two, could they run up against the powerhouse? We know that is Netflix and no other streamer has been able to really come close to where Netflix is. Of course, Disney Plus has a, a stronghold when you think about the Disney customer and could a combination of the two of Paramount Plus and Max create a stronger streamer there? Yeah, right. I mean, it just you, you're right to point the broader trends, you know, cord cutting, Mm -hmm. Does force um, these companies kind of rethink their futures here? A lot of times you talk about media consolidation, you could argue like at a very high level it makes sense, but right. there's always these bigger questions about price, about you have to take in price. future of ad sales, your financing costs. Um, that can sort of, the backdrop is often really mm -hmm. challenging to make a deal happen. Right. Maybe maybe they'll find one here. We'll see. I mean, it's early. Maybe it doesn't happen at all. But And the question out. of how leveraged is uh, WBD in this, um, you know, where is the cash coming from and where is the capital coming from for Zaslav to make a deal like this happen? That's a fun one to keep a look on. Let's get a check on some trending tickers here as well. Not just Paramount, but shares of General Mills. They're falling in today's trading action after the packaged goods giant cut its full year guidance, citing softening demand from consumers in its most recent quarter. So that was part of the story here. You know, this stock has been under pressure, uh, down about 20%. has not been easy if you're long this name. The outlook was not great. Cut its organic sales growth. Yeah. Key here, the commentary about the consumer from the CEO saying, we're seeing consumers showing stronger than an anticipated value-seeking behavior, and that is delaying volume recovery. They also talked about competition playing a role. So they're now looking for organic net sales growth in a range of flat to down 1%, was in a range of 3 or 4% growth. And it looks like basically what they're saying is now consumers appear to be responding to that foodflation issue, right? And we know that inflation had been a key component and increasing prices had been a key component in uh, the strategy of some of these consumer-facing companies, right? But General Mills really noticing how the consumer is reacting now and the consumer making a trade, town, trade down. Maybe they aren't buying the Dunkaroos anymore. Maybe they're buying whatever is the store version was the, the great value version of that, yeah. uh, you know, um, or Bisquick. So, uh, look, TD Cohen put out a note on that saying, you know, noting that they um, their organic sales missed their estimate by a big degree. Pet food was that big miss there when you uh, when you think about General Mills and, the, and they talked about just what the risks are here. Uh, mature packaged food companies having that difficulty kind of keeping pace with where the consumer is going and what consumer preferences are. And of course, obviously, the elasticity question, how much elasticity does that consumer have? when you think about what they want to buy. All right, another ticker we're watching, shares of Aon. That's the management and consulting firm. They are dro they dropped today, falling 6% after agreeing to buy uh, insurers NFP for around $13.4 billion as a cash and stock deal. It's uh, part of a push by the company to take up more space in the insurance brokerage and wealth management deal. So we know that often happens with where the, the buying party in a deal uh, gets ding. Uh, the question is also obviously how they're they're raising uh, the funds for this part of that is through debt. So that is one of the issues of concern and is this too rich a price that Aon is paying for NFP? Yeah, and that, that's exactly what some analysts were saying. The price is higher, they note, than recent deals. Um, they note, in their opinion, this is more of a reaction, in their words, to losing ground versus a compelling deal. And you do see the stock slipping today, basically now flat for the year. Yeah, and I mean, Aon wanted to do a deal before. They couldn't do the one they wanted to do before uh, with Willis Towers Watson. Now they're kind of coming back at the deal uh, space. Uh, they've got NFP. Uh, we'll see how the investor community continues to react to them adding this to their balance sheet. The deal is expected to close uh, middle of next year. Um, it's going to include, it say, uh, says about $400 million in one-time transactions, integration, 
costs it is expected to dilute adjusted earnings in 2025 is they're finally expected to break even on that deal by 2026. So we'll be watching that one. Meantime, shipping companies are steering clear of the Suez Canal to avoid attacks in the Red Sea. This comes amid existing problems in the Panama Canal and it's forcing ships, including oil companies, to take longer routes to ensure safety, threatening supply chains and the global economy. For more on the effects of the Red Sea attacks, we want to bring in FreightWave CEO Craig Fuller. Uh, Craig, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, when you think about kind of the big picture here, what does this mean in terms of the flow of commerce? What's at stake here? Yeah, we're in a whole new sort of generation of, of uh, call it sort of the post-Cold War globalization uh, story. Uh, if you think about what we've enjoyed for the last 30 years is really very stable uh, global trade. Uh, we've been really spoiled because uh, the seas have been relatively peaceful. There haven't been attacks on commercial vessels of any at any real level of scale. There have been certainly pirates, but not uh, much higher in state sponsored actors or, or other folks that are actually attacking big container ships. So this is a, a new generation of, of potential risks. And I think this uh, really forces the globe to reconfigure, forces supply chain professionals to think differently about where they source their products, how they source their products. And what this will do is further encourage more investment in nearshoring and uh, reshoring back to the Americas. And Craig, let me ask you, um, as you look at these merchant ships due to these attacks, as they're now kind of rerouting here, Craig, um, what does that mean for their costs? And do you expect them to pass along those costs to us, to Craig and Josh? Yeah, so the, the reality is that Europe is far more exposed to this uh, element than we are here in the United States. You know, the majority of our trade, at least in container goods, uh, comes out of Asia and into the West Coast of the United States. So for us, at least as long as those seas remain peaceful, we're not going to see a, a pretty significant tax on U.S. consumer goods. Uh, Europe, on the other hand, is far more exposed. They're far more dependent upon the Red Sea, and they will certainly pay a tax uh, of additional shipping costs uh, moving products from Asia into, into Europe. So that's where the, the cost will be borne. Uh, more so in Europe than here in the United States. When you think about what are the um, risks and the big risks here, could this, could the scale of this project and is one of the concerns of potential economic war? You know, like, you know, the reality is that in a second Cold War, which it appears that we're in, is that you really supply chains are the front lines, and so, um, you know, this isn't a. a there's not a military sort of breakout between the United States uh, and, uh, but we are seeing, you know, limited skirmishes. We're certainly seeing what's happened with Israel and Gaza. Uh, that seems to have accelerated. We're seeing, you know, what's happened with Russia and Ukraine. But this is, a, we're moving to a multipolar world, which we haven't really seen since the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so we're in a whole new world and supply chains are those front lines. And so, uh, you know, civilian vessels have been largely unaffected uh, in terms of, of moving global trade for the past 30 years. And if this continues to become a bigger issue, it's going to change the reconfiguration of global supply chains. And really the story of, you know, the, the country that's going to be most impacted by this is, is frankly China, because they're so dependent on global trade that they need peaceful trade lanes to move their products. The United States, on the other hand, could potentially benefit from this in the long run as production moves back to the Americas and we we, we disentangle uh, ourselves from Asia. And Craig, I'm also interested, um, you know, we do have U.S. Navy assets now in that area, but do these merchant ships, Craig, do they also, in addition to that, frequently and regularly hire their own private security contractors? They do hire private security contractors to go through contested waters. But the reality is if we're talking about, you know, much more advanced uh, missile technology and, you know, these are weapons of war, not weapons of sort of pilot uh, pirates that you see, uh, you know, unsophisticated guys in small boats. We're talking about much higher level of, of sophistication in terms of military technology. It's a whole different ballgame. And certainly civilian contractors 
are largely underprepared for this type of action. And that's why this has been so profound. That's why the insurance companies are forcing the container uh, firms to move product uh, away from the Red Sea right now is because they're not willing to insure. And, and look, the, the ocean container companies also don't want their crews uh, potentially exposed to this. So there's a lot of things happening. Um, and what we're going to see is until this is resolved through military action, I think we're going to see the container companies that are going to still force uh, ships to to go around the Red Sea. And you're going to see insurance companies that are refusing to insure uh, ships that go through the Red Sea. So the reality is we don't know what the United States, how they will react to it. Europe is far more exposed, but unfortunately, they've outsourced a lot of their military uh, protection to the United States. And so there's a lot of questions geopolitical that frankly need to be answered that go beyond supply chain questions. Craig Fuller, it's an important topic and one I think we're going to keep talking a lot about. Thank you so much, Craig, for your time and insight today. Thank you so much for having me. And coming up, shares of Micron rising after reporting first quarter results. We're going to dig into those results right after the break.
Micron reporting results and investors like what they see. Let's get right to those results. Q1 adjusted loss per share, 95 cents. Street was at a loss per share of $1. Q1 revenue, 4.73 billion. Street was at 4.54 billion. Good news on that forecast too. As for guidance, so looking for Q2 revenue of between 5.1 and 5.5 billion. The street was closer to 4.99 billion. And the loss per share, minus certain items, 21 cents to 35 cents. Analysts thought the loss was going to come in closer to 62 cents, so much better there. Stock is higher right now in the after hours. Remember, it was already up about 60% this year heading into this print. Um, and, of course, we care about Micron, Diane, because it is the largest U.S. memory chip maker, and its, its chips go into a really wide range of products. Think smartphones, PC, data yep. centers. So importantly, it'll be very curious to hear on the call what they're seeing about that demand environment. Indeed. I mean, they're saying in terms of the release of their results, um, uh, this is from Micro Micron Technology President, CEO Sanjay, uh, saying that it's strong execution and pricing drove these better than expected financial results. Uh, they expect business fundamentals to improve throughout 2024, and that's certainly uh, what investors are looking for, what the outlook is going to be second quarter revenue is expected to be uh, between 5.1 to 5.5 billion. So certainly uh, being rewarded on the street and a little bit above what the street's expectations were in terms of the forecast. All right, well, let's get much more reaction out of this Micron report. We've got Patrick Moorhead here. He is founder and CEO of More Insights and Strategy. Patrick, it is always great to see you. I know you are <laughs> positive on this name. We talked about it heading into this print. Just give me your response to what you're seeing so far. Yeah, so Josh, uh, the entire memory and storage market has really been under assault uh, for the past year, 18 months. And it was classic 25-year uh, cycle that we've seen repeated probably five times, which is you build a lot of inventory, you build a lot of capacity, demand goes down, you're reeling in inventory, and then it comes down to an execution game. And I think Micron showed that is executing well burning off inventory, not only at customers, but also inside of their own uh, manufacturing facilities. And then it's all about when the demand comes back, right? And then people will be basically swimming in cash. Uh, and I think that Micron's doing really well. And and I'm not I'm not surprised. This was their third beat and beat in a row. Mm. The company is super conservative uh, about the future. Uh, for good reason. And I think that when, as we get into next year and the potential super cycle that uh, AI brings in all the product categories, we could see some serious growth here. Patrick, when you think about kind of the investment thesis for 2024, they spoke well, and this forecast is uh, coming in better than expected in terms of revenue expectations. Uh, but Micron is not like the head of the pack, strong player. Uh, but when you think about the semiconductor space in 2024, what are you looking for? And especially when you head to this earnings call, what are you expecting to hear? What themes are you looking for? Yeah, so some themes that I'm looking for is detail about the future. And while Micron can't control interest rates, it has to operate in a world of what if. And I'd like to hear more about what they think about the AI accelerator uh, plays, which uh, with their high bandwidth memory is, is a huge part. And also in the middle of the year, I believe we have a chance for a super cycle uh, with AI PCs and AI-based smartphones to get everybody uh, on the latest technology and essentially bring what we've seen out of the cloud uh, onto the device. It's more secure, uh, it's faster, uh, and it's a lot more uh, private. I wanna hear what they're saying about that. And finally, the PC gaming market uh, is rebounding uh, across a lot of the names you would expect, like NVIDIA. What does that mean for graphics memory, a special memory called GDDR? And Patrick, when we, we talk about Micron, they do have competition, right? So Samsung, um, right. SK Hynix. When you think about those three, Patrick, who has the tech lead in your opinion? Yeah, so right now it's a three horse race on market share. And for years before uh, Sanjay Mahatra got in, they were laggards uh, in, in type of technology. And then they were uh, first uh, with a certain capacity memory at a certain bit rate. They were first with certain uh, high bandwidth memory, cert, uh, first with certain flavors of 
uh, smartphone and PC memory. So uh, there are some cycles that Micron is ahead. There are some cycles that it, it's in the game, but I think everybody is surprised because quite frankly, it was, it was a two horse race uh, before uh, Sanjay uh, got in leadership uh, six or seven years ago. And I have to answer, it, it just depends. I think the important part is that they're competitive. And 10 years ago, from a technology basis, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It was a two horse race, not a three horse race. And Patrick, I wanna ask you about Micron versus China. We know they're dealing with a ban. How do you feel they're navigating that? And what are you looking to hear from them about how they navigate that going forward? Yeah, I think they, they already talked about uh, the percentage and I think that's built in uh, to investor expectations. So anything above getting zeroed out in China is upside. Uh, and I think that was wise to do that because you cannot predict uh, what China is gonna do. Uh, and as I've said on this show before, it's really a tit for tat, nothing special, right? Micron is, is paying for uh, the clampdown in the US of folks like Huawei. And, and before that, uh, 10, 15 years ago with Cisco and IBM. So this is just the, the next round in the China geopolitical situation. Anything that's above zero is upside for the company. Patrick, I'm gonna get you out of here on this broader question, my friend. Uh, listen, obviously AI, big theme in 2023. Right. I'm interested to get your take on how you think that market evolves, Patrick, in 2024, and which companies you stand to stand to benefit. We talk a lot about NVIDIA, AMD, Microsoft. Are there other companies, Patrick, that you think investors right now should have on their radar? Yeah, so in addition to uh, the symbols and the companies we've seen benefit so far, NVIDIA, AMD, Broadcom, Marvell, Microsoft, IBM, and Salesforce, it's going to be those companies and it's going to get bigger. I expect to see the super cycle mid-year back half for all AI PCs and all AI PC chips. So the Intels of the world, the Qualcomm's of the world, and then you have the device makers, the Dell, the HP, the Lenovo, and Microsoft, quite frankly, with Windows. And then you're going to see edge infrastructure for AI kick in, names like HPE, Dell Technologies. And, and then I also think this is going to go to uh, smaller SaaS players like Adobe uh, and Box. That, I believe, is going to be the second wave uh, of AI benefit in 2024. All right, Patrick Moorhead, we will have to leave it there for Micron. Of course, I know you need to get to that earnings call. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us and breaking down these fresh this fresh release for us. Thank you. All right. Coming up, we've got more from Yahoo Finance. That's all on the other side of the break.
The Orlando Magic rebranding its arena today, which will now be called the Kia Center. And the first event under the new name is a game Wednesday night between the Magic and the Miami Heat. Joining me now is Orlando Magic CEO Alex Martins. A new day here after a 13-year run at the Amway Center. Talk to me about what this partnership means for the Magic. Well, this partnership is, is really the biggest partnership that a team can have uh, in having a naming rights partner. This is really an expansion of our partnership that we've had with Kia now for this the 16th season. Uh, and this will bring Kia the opportunity through, um, you know, the, the global brand of the NBA and the Orlando Magic and playing our games at the Kia Center will bring Kia international exposure. Uh, so, as, as we said, you know, when we announced uh, the naming on the building, this comes at a time when Kia is really on the rise as an automobile manufacturing brand, and the Magic is also on the rise as an NBA franchise. Um, and it, it'll, it, it's a great expansion of that uh, partnership that we believe uh, Kia and the Magic will benefit for uh, many years to come. Yeah, we've certainly seen an expanded footprint for Kia, particularly around EVs as well. Um, let me talk to you about what's been playing out with the NBA, because we've been talking a lot about the change in sports viewing experience. Um, it's not just about the big networks anymore. It is about the streaming sites as well. The NBA looking ahead to the 2024-25 season when they have to renegotiate this contract. As you think about your team and getting the biggest viewership there, you think that the network cable play is still the best way to get the biggest audience out there? I think the network cable play is always going to be in place. Um, there's always going to be those that uh, will go to uh, the, the network cable uh, stations to uh, view their, their sports programming. But uh, we all know the proliferation of streaming, particularly since the NBA completed its last uh, national media deal. And I, I fully expect that as we go into uh, this next couple of years and the negotiation on the national television rights deals for, for the NBA, that we will see streaming partners come into play. Um, obviously, there is a, a large population uh, that is watching their, their media through streaming devices this, th at this time. And we believe that it's time you know, for the NBA to also broadcast our games in that manner as well. You know, appointment sports programming is still in high demand. And now with the proliferation of streaming, I think the NBA will have another outlet for us to broadcast our games on in this next media deal. Yeah, so it looks like a multiple partnerships could be in play here. Um, Alex, I'm just curious, specifically with your fan, ba fan base, how you have seen sort of the, that shift in viewership, where you're seeing your fans coming in from. Well, certainly uh, the younger fan base is is coming through streaming platforms and, uh, you know, through social media, et cetera. Uh, we here at the Orlando Magic have uh, put on a, a large effort uh, to expand our content creation uh, onto multiple platforms, particularly through social. Uh, but streaming is, is definitely a large part of our future plans uh, as, as we continue to expand upon our content creation here at the local level. And of course, you know, we have a, a, a regional sports network um, with Valley Sports that is um, currently in the, the Diamond Sports bankruptcy situation. We're watching that very closely uh, to see what may come of, of it, um, you know, in the next uh, few months in particular as they go through their bankruptcy proceedings. But you know, the news this week that, um, you know, Amazon uh, may be interested in, in uh, investing uh, in the Diamond Sports Group. Uh, is uh, certainly a positive news, uh, and we certainly hope that something along those lines will uh, enable us to continue to have our partnership with uh, Diamond Sports, and particularly Bally Sports Florida, that broadcasts all of our uh, regional games here um, in, in Central Florida. Alex, I'm curious to get your take on another team that's been making some headlines in the league, and that's the Dallas Mavericks, uh, with the Adelson family behind the Ve Las Vegas Sands um, recently, uh, you know, calling for uh, taking a majority control, uh, controlling stake from Mark Cuban. Hasn't been signed off just yet, but but that proposal itself has started a lot of discussions about whether in fact that the business, the valuation, the value of these companies are, are shifting. It feels like at least there's more of an embrace of sports betting on the part of NBA teams as well as other sports teams. 
Is that something that you're comfortable with? I'm certainly comfortable with it, you know, because of the fact that uh, the league uh, has all of the uh, protections in place, the precautions in place to ensure that it doesn't impact uh, our game in any way. Uh, we certainly don't deal with it um, or haven't dealt with it, you know, here in the state of Florida because we haven't had sports betting in place uh, until the last two weeks. So, you know, we'll we'll have to see, you know, the outcome of all that here at the local level, but I'm certainly comfortable that the NBA in particular has all the safeguards in place to ensure that the proliferation of sports betting doesn't have a negative impact on our game. Yeah, something that you'd consider if it is within the state of Florida in terms of a partnership? Uh, we, we, we would certainly consider a partnership uh, here in the state of Florida with uh, a, a sports betting uh, company. Of course, here in the state of Florida, the, the uh, online sports Sports betting has been awarded to uh, the Seminole Indian tribe um, and, you know, through their Hard Rock Casino brand. Uh, so we actually have had conversations uh, with them uh, previously, and those are intensifying now. And we certainly hope that uh, sometime in the near future that we'll be able to have a, a, a partner, you know, on the sports betting side here at the Orlando Magic. Finally, Alex, uh, we're coming off of the first in-season tournament in the NBA. Uh, I bring that up as an L.A. Laker fan, which uh, took home that prize there. But um, what's the verdict on your end? Is this something you want the league to continue? Was it a big boost? What's your takeaway? I, 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 my takeaway is a resounding success uh, beyond the expectations that any of us would have had for the in-season tournament. And just a, a local example for you, on the days that we played our in-season tournament games uh, this year, compared to those same dates uh, a year ago, which they were just regular season games, our viewership on television was up 165%. So that's just one local example. Of course, uh, that was the case for every team in the league. That was the case for all of our national television partners and those games that were on national uh, television as well. So. Uh, I think it's it was a resounding success. I think it's here to stay. I think it's a great asset, a new uh, media uh, platform for, for us in the league. And it brought attention to the league at a time typically uh, where fans aren't completely, weren't completely tuned in in the early season. Um, I would say that we had more attention on the NBA in the month of November this year than we ever have. And so I think this is uh, certainly a, a, a platform that it's here to stay. Uh, we love it at the Orlando Magic, and we certainly believe that uh, it's going to be a, a great success moving forward. Yeah, 165% bump, certainly significant there. Alex Martins, the CEO of the Orlando Magic. Thanks so much for joining us today. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. We'll be right back. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. We are following breaking news. Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zaslav reportedly meeting with Paramount Global CEO Bob Backish on Tuesday to discuss 
a possible merger. That's according to Axios. Joining us now is William Cohen, founding partner at Puck News. Bill, thank you so much for joining us as usual. So this, we've got just this fresh deal activity. We know the media landscape has been uh, going through a lot of consolidation. Uh, look, this Warner Brothers Discovery deal, that was just uh, about, I mean, that was pretty fresh as well when you think about this. So what does this say to you about the media landscape now? Well, it's uh, rapidly needs to consolidate whether that will actually uh, happen as quickly as people would like. I mean, let's let's remember uh, WBD Warner Brothers Discovery was created uh, in April of uh, 2022 uh, and it was created in a reverse Morris Trust structure. So that means that David Zaslav can't do any deals or change that structure until April 2024. So after two years are up. So why is he having this conversation now? Well, because Sherry Redstone is clearly trying to sell Paramount Global now. She you know, signed an NDA with some financial buyers. Uh, she's now uh, putting this thing into serious play. So why not uh, you know, come and have a meeting with Bob Backish uh, as uh, Axios is reporting? Makes total sense, but let's not forget, can't do anything until April of 2024. So this is all just sort of preliminaries, if you ask me. All right, so it's preliminary, Bill, but um, does the deal make sense to you sort of as, as a strategy? Mm -hmm. Yes, it absolutely makes sense to me. I mean, I think I don't think it's necessarily Zaslav's first choice. I mean, I think Zaslav's first choice would be to do some sort of deal with Brian Roberts for uh, NBCU. But my sense is that that idea is kind of faded in recent months. Uh, and so his uh, second best choice, because he still needs to get bigger to be a dominant player, he still wants to be bigger than he already is, uh, is, uh, you know, to go with uh, uh, this, Paramount Global, which is obviously a much smaller deal uh, than an NBCU deal. Uh, you know, does it create uh, potential regulatory problems for him? Yes, it does, because uh, you know, he's got CNN, uh, would be potentially merging, combining with CBS, creating problems. He's got, uh, you know, Warner Brothers uh, movie studio potentially combining with Paramount's movie studio, which would create uh, potential antitrust problems. This is not going to be an easy deal from a regulatory point of view. On the other hand, it wouldn't have been easy for him to do NBCU either. But I think the argument could be made. Uh, we'll see how successful it would be that uh, you know, WBD needs to be a bigger player to compete against Disney, to compete against Netflix, to compete against Amazon, to compete against, compete against Apple. So um, you know, it's all in play right now, and it makes total sense that he would have this conversation. Uh, but you know, we're still a long way from a deal. And speaking of uh, just the issues with regard to this deal, one of the concerns could certainly be the debt levels for WBD. That's they've been dealing with their debt levels and you know, kind of uh, addressing that issue. But how how could this deal be structured? Like, where does the financing? I mean, I, I suppose it would be some creative financing uh, to come from to support this deal. Yeah, so this, it's a great point. Uh, you know, David Zaslav has paid down around $12 uh, billion of debt, going from 55 to about 43 of net debt. Good for him. Uh, Paramount has $14 billion of uh, net debt, 15 minus a billion in cash. Uh, combining those two, and they're both sort of on the triple B cliff mm -hmm. in terms of credit ratings. Uh, combining the two might uh, push them both over the cliff. Uh, and uh, result in downgrades and uh, a debt that could be immediately uh, redeemable and cause all sorts of problems. Uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, maybe by April of 2024, uh, the debt markets would have uh, thought a little bit. Uh, the interest rate uh, that the Fed uh, rise raising that the Fed uh, has suggested it's going to cool off might have cooled off by then. Maybe the capital markets would be open and stronger than they have been recently. And maybe there's a Wall Street would come along and try to refinance all that or what need, parts that needed to be refinanced. But it would create a behemoth with an awful lot of debt. There's no question about it. And it could result in a debt downgrade, which would result in some of that uh, paramount debt anyway, being uh, immediately redeemable at 101 cents on the dollar. Mm -hmm. 
And Bill, I'm interested, you know, you, you can look at the media landscape and you can understand strategically why consolidation makes sense. But then, Bill, you know, you kind of look at this backdrop and, and you were talking about this, you're suggesting it a much more, you know, it's a much more aggressive regulatory landscape. It's financing costs. It's questions about the ad market. Is it, is it just a tougher backdrop to get deals done right now? Yes. I mean, it wouldn't be hard uh, for, say, Apple to buy Paramount. Uh, you know, it'd be a chip shot. Uh, but for Warner Brothers Discovery, with its $43 billion of debt and Paramount's $15 billion of debt and the, their overlap, you know, in terms of business lines, it's going to be difficult strategically and regulatorily to get this through. Uh, and so, uh, but, you know, David Zaslav is nothing if not ambitious. He's not clearly doesn't think he's done yet in Hollywood. He wants more in Hollywood. And this would be you know, a relatively uh, inexpensive way, more inexpensive way for him to do that than to try to combine with NBCU, which I think would be his first choice, which is probably not going to happen. And OK, so I want to ask you then, with the direction of the media industry and all the consolidation that we've seen recently and still more clearly to come, Who's positioned most to be the top three winners going forward? Let's say this deal goes through. Is this a winner? It's a lot of debt. It's a yeah. lot of debt. Uh, and, you know, they haven't done a great job of increasing their EBITDA yet. Both companies are kind of struggling, putting two struggling EBITDA companies together. Does that make it better? Potentially. Good. Could, you know, David uh, has shown he can pay down debt. I think this combination could be a winner if you could get it, possibly get it through. But that's a big if, uh, regulatorily. Uh, you know, I think Disney, of course, will end up still being a winner. But, you know, uh, when it comes to the media landscape, I'm beginning to think more and more, it's like Apple is, uh, you know, positioned to be a winner. Amazon is positioned to be a winner. Microsoft is positioned to be a winner. Google is positioned to be a winner because they have such huge market caps and very little debt and uh, very little regulatory issues when it comes to the media landscape. Uh, you know, these uh, you know, old-fashioned media companies have uh, a lot of trouble uh, trying to do kind of a, a horizontal uh, merger like this. Bill, it is always great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time and insight, as always. Thank you, guys. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. You too. For a good part of 2023, Anheuser-Busch InBev has struggled to rebound from the effects of a widespread boycott of Bud Light. And now the company facing a battle from within Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma has that story. Brooke. Yeah, good afternoon, Josh. I mean, certainly it's been what a year for Bud Light. We saw volumes here in North America drop 17 percent last quarter. And now another looming obstacle in Bud Light's way, that strike. The contract expires February 29, 2024. Now, this will ultimately lead to 12 U.S. breweries threatening to walk out if Anheuser-Busch doesn't come out with a strong new contract. Now, Anheuser-Busch did tell Yahoo Finance that they are aware of and plan to negotiate in good faith. But Wall Street seemingly unfazed by this looming strike. One analyst telling me that it's normal that unions are making aggressive noises ahead of negotiations. Another analyst telling me that AB InBev may be able to skirt around this be given their international reach, saying that it's not existential in the same sense that the U.S. is by far the biggest market, but it's not the only one. Another uh, important note here is that sales in March and April are relatively light and things tend to pick up around Memorial Day. So there is some time for Anheuser-Busch and Team Service to be able to figure this all out. Yeah, and when we think about kind of um, uh, labor activity this year, there's been a lot of that, obviously. Uh, when, when we think about, say, earlier this year, the Teamsters had reached a deal with UPS, what can the takeaway be in terms of how that was framed when you compare that to this situation? Right, well, with UPS, it was a last-minute mm -hmm. deal. Yep. They averted that strike. They got raises. They got a two-tier yep. contract, among other initiatives. And one expert, David Manlin, senior fellow at Center for American Progress, said investors can expect a similar scenario playing out for Anheuser-Busch. There's a long record of pretty decent labor relations at both UPS and, and Anheuser-Busch. So um, while there might be concerns right now about a contract uh, and, and, you know, escalating fights, there is a, a track record to rely on that they could fall back on and hopefully reach an agreement before there's a strike.
But of course, there's so many moving parts going into this, and it's really whether or not Team Servers and Anheuser Busch will be able to reach an agreement come February 29th. Of course, not too far away, but it's coming up quick. Yeah, indeed. Right. Brooke, thank you. Appreciate it. And coming up, what to watch tomorrow, we break down the stories you need to know to start your day. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. New consumer confidence numbers coming out today shows an optimistic outlook on the economy and personal finances. But there's still anxiety for many Americans managing debt or trying to buy a home. Our next guest says those two things are among the top financial goals in the new year. Joining us now is Michael Lear, Wells Fargo Head of Advice and Planning. Michael, it's always great to have you on. Uh, so when you think about how consumers are feeling compared to the data you have, what's, I guess, the divergence? So when we think about how consumers are feeling, that optimism and the data that people are still managing spending, managing credit and debt, they want to buy a home, they want to prepare for emergencies. The idea here is that we all are still moving into a relative sense of uncertainty in 2024. Is the economy still going to be uh, sustained beyond any kind of recession? Is inflation, are we still going to see it drop? Is the Fed going to really move forward with cutting interest rates? There's still that uncertainty. So it's a bit of a tale of two cities, some optimism for the future, but also preparing for the worst. And then how do you prepare for the worst? Because there's been a lot of data that we've seen over this holiday season about the rise in BNPL. Uh, what would you advise consumers to do? Sure, it doesn't carry the same kind of, uh, I guess, uh, credit debt issues rather that credit cards uh, carry when you're thinking about, say, high, super high interest rates. Uh, but what is it that consumers need to keep in mind about preparing for the worst or just the unexpected? So there are three things that I would consider. The first is really thinking about how much you can sustainably afford to spend in the new year. And so a lot of people go into the new year, uh, they, they've already positioned themselves in a way that maybe doesn't set them out, uh, themselves up for success because they've overspent during the holidays. We're approaching that time right mm -hmm. now for a lot of Americans um, and also they've kind of kicked the can down the road on some of the, the things that they've wanted to do in terms of their goals so they could afford gifts. So what I'd encourage people to do is really think about really, let's say, tempering that spending for the holidays and beyond, you know, the vacations people take afterward so that you can start the new year off right. The second thing I would really think about is what feeling are you going for in 2024? Do you want that sense of peace of mind, security? One of the top goals we have in a capability we call Life Sync at Wells Fargo is peace of mind. So if you're going for that sense of peace of mind, make sure that you're putting some money away for emergencies, you know, whether that's paying off debt, whether that's something that happens like a flat tire or you know something breaks that you weren't expecting. And the third thing, is really make sure you know where your money is at all times and how you intend to use it. So is it best to use a credit card? Is it best to use a bank account to spend on those unexpected things, you know, to be prepared for those emergencies? 
really thinking about where that money is coming from and what you're using it for is really going to be critical in 2024. And Michael, I want to quickly touch on uh, kind of housing and a, a, a much bigger ticket purchase. Um, you know, buying a home has really become a challenge for people within this high interest rate climate. Uh, how, what are you seeing in terms of how people are planning around it? Especially, we, we, we talked earlier, we are seeing some unlocking of the housing market, but really the catalysts in that market have been life events recently. Uh, how, how are people planning around this for the new year? So we're thinking, we're, we're seeing a couple different things. The first is that people are really planning ahead to save for that downtown payment. So they're really taking the opportunity to set a goal, think about the size of the home they want, really managing to the ongoing, think of it as mortgage payment that they can afford. And they're saving up that down payment very intentionally month by month. So that's an interesting consumer behavior to see, building up enough money for a down payment to sustainably afford a house that they want. The second piece that we're seeing is that people are willing to wait for the home that is right for them and to build up that amount of money and also get help, get help from a parent, get help from a spouse or a partner. You know, how are they going to afford that home and make sure that they can afford it in that sustainable way and asking for help, getting other people to participate in it is a way that we see consumers really thinking about home purchases these days. All right, I love that. You always bring great uh, information and data to us. Michael Learsh, uh, Wells Fargo, Head of Advice and Planning. Uh, thank you for joining us today and happy holidays. Thank you, happy holidays to you too. You got it. Time now for what to watch Thursday, December 21st. More housing data on tap. The weekly reading on mortgage rates. 30-year fixed rate mortgage is down for seven straight weeks, dipping below 7% for the first time since August. And shifting to the broader economy, we're expecting the latest on initial jobless claims in the morning, measuring the number of people who filed for unemployment insurance for the past week. Economists estimating a jump from the prior week. And then on the earnings front, Nike reporting earnings for its fiscal second quarter. Reed will give us insight into the retail giant's early holiday sales. Investors will be keeping a close eye on U.S. sales after Nike missed estimates for the first time in two years back in September. And turning to tech, Apple losing its bid to delay an import and sales ban on the Watch Series 9 and Watch Ultra 2. Starting tomorrow, you will no longer be able to buy an Apple Watch at an Apple store or on its website. And we're just hours away from the Powerball drawing taking place at 11 p.m. Eastern. If you've got a ticket, keep your fingers crossed for that jackpot of $572 million. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.